Excellent. And somebody asked in the chat in terms of how can they get access to the Main Street Lending Fund? So um, in the Q&A, so you want to hit on that and then we'll go over to Marcelo. So as it's my understanding, they're still working through the last details of the Main Street Lending Program. And Joe, you can jump into this because you're privy to some of those maybe C-level conversations out there, but it's, it's coming soon. Uh, it will be run through the banks. Again, that is a loan program, as Joe referenced, and the minimum loan for the Main Street Lending Program is $500,000. So it's not gonna be the right fit for everybody. Again, the due diligence is very important. Make sure you know which one of these makes the most sense for your business. Perfect. Awesome. Well, I was going to ask a question and then um, that uh, was asked by Jacqueline in terms of the PPP is very fluid and the guidelines seem to change. What guidelines uh, should my company use for guidance um, for the loan forgiveness, uh, the date of the funds received at the date of the application or newest guidance guidelines? What are you guys' uh, date, thoughts on that? Date of loan disbursement. Perfect. Okay. So um, James, um, Jim, from your perspective, thoughts with regards to misconceptions and or things that people should be thinking about, business owners? Yeah, um, you know, first, I agree. These, these loan programs, especially PPP, they're not silver bullets. Uh, I, I do think it's, in a sense, it's grant, but there are strings attached, as they are to, with many of these programs. Um, the, the misconceptions really that, that I see in terms on the part of small businesses, whether they're dealing with the government or not, it's not so much of the, the different vehicles that are available to them, but what's gonna come down the line. Uh, there will be audits, there will be investigations, there will be increase. Uh, the government will be out looking, not, you know, they, 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 in any event, they're gonna be targeting the, 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 the higher dollar recipients. Uh, but it's it's still going to recur as it always does. Um, if you look to in, in the past, uh, uh, you know the stimulus and that type of thing is that you're always going to have government audits. So what what the recipients need to do is to very carefully, very fully, very methodically document the use of the funds uh, for purposes of, of justifying the forgiveness. Um, that. It's going to include segregating the funds in a separate account, uh, planning for the usage for the approved purposes, whether it's payroll or the limited non-payroll uh, buckets that they can put it in. Um, and you have to look at it over that, you know, eight, 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 eight week period um, and, and log the usage, log it carefully. Uh, maintain copies of your records. Uh, this is what the accountants, this is what the lawyers will tell you. Make sure you have the records uh, handy and, and available. Um, and if you use a, a payroll provider, coordinate with your payroll provider. Many companies outsource payroll. It's, it's very important that the, the payroll firm, whoever it is, is, is on the same page in terms of the documentation. So it's, it's the, the steps that the recipients need to take to make sure that they can justify the forgiveness. Because the whole idea, if you want to make it a grant, you have to meet the requirements for forgiveness and there are requirements. Excellent. And then Marcelo, from a risk perspective as well, I mean, what are some of the, the things that you're seeing in, in terms of mistakes, misconceptions that people really need to focus on? I think a, a lot of my peers have touched upon them, but it's the first one is what are the products out there, right? Um, it, it's not just PPP, but everybody else has mentioned there are multiple different products available to them and, and they have to feed their specific need and specific business. So small business should look at what's available and what's best for them in the short term and long term. That's number one. Um, then I would say, the, the, what do they qualify for within those products, right? Um, they won't qualify for everything. And there are certain restrictions with the different products. You know, we, we get a lot of questions on, on Main Street. But Main Street, actually, they, they have restrictions on dividends. They have restrictions on executive compensation. They have a lot of restrictions that, you know, small and mid-sized businesses have to consider before they apply for it. And they get those loans. And um, there's also, uh, as, as we say, the biggest difference is Main Street uh, it's, it's, not, it's not forgivable, right? You can have all the documentation, you can use those funds for paycheck and payroll, but that doesn't mean they will be forgiven. So people have to be very clear 
um, either through their own reading of the guidelines and the FAQs that continue to be, um, they continue to evolve, uh, or they have to go and talk to their uh, accountant, their lawyer to, to get some guidance, get some advice. Uh, and that goes to the, the third area of misconception when it comes to documentation that is required to get the, uh, the loan, the grant approved, and then how the documentation that you will need in the future to get that forgiven. Um, and a lot of small businesses are not used to dealing with the level of scrutiny and, and request that this will demand on their part. Uh, keeping, as James was saying, keeping the funds separate, using these funds that they can demonstrate clearly that these were used for certain purposes. Uh, I have the, the documentation evidence, not just them saying that, but I have the documentation to evidence all of that over the next six to eight weeks and then be able to answer any questions that might come from the bank or from the government or from any potential audit that they might go through. So uh, qualification and documentation, I think, are the two big categories. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you. And I'm going to ask this question and any of the panelists can answer. Um, uh, so it, it has came in from the chat with regards to the Main Street loan applications and um, indicating that, you know, some banks are not going for that. So not sure what the option is for the small businesses. So what are your thoughts with regards to the response to Akancha's question? So I would say that's, that's a fair comment. Um, I, I heard from some of my peers, not in this panel, but in different uh, forums that some of them are considered not actually offering uh, Main Street because of the demand and the scrutiny that that will put on, on the bank and on the clients. And so uh, we're giving the advice to the clients. These are the conditions. This is what it requires. Uh, if you wanna move forward, we can move forward, right? Uh, but I know some of my peers are deciding not to even offer it because of the, uh, the scrutiny that, that we know will come in the future uh, by participating in these type of programs. Good. Any other advice or perspectives from the panel on that particular question? So Anna had I mentioned earlier about some other local and countywide grant and loan programs. Do check that out. I know Arlington has some. Uh, I sit on the board of the Community Business Partnership, which is the organization that's administering the Fairfax County Loan Program. Uh, that's almost exhausted, uh, but they're hoping to get uh, some more funds allocated to that. So there are some additional options for small business. Just make sure to check local, check with your county, see what else is out there. And, and really, sometimes you're going to have to have that co tough conversation about how to recapitalize without uh, debt, right? Whether it's uh, raising funds through friends and family or, or, or finding other ways to diversify your business income to make sure you're on the right side that's coming out, out of it again. Uh, it, it's unprecedented times, but uh, necessity is a mother ingenuity, as, as, as we all know. So hopefully uh, small businesses can get creative on how they continue to sustain it and, and, and drive through. Excellent. Well, we're going to skip to our final question um, just by time. These, these, there's you know, a lot going on in this, so you guys have provided some great insights. Um, as we think to um, the, the kind of final areas, this big picture, kind of what do you think the biggest advice for small businesses right now facing uncertain futures? And I know we've hit on some of them, but if there, you could kind of layer or level onto that and be thinking about it from the perspective of um, also the question that we didn't get to in great depth, but did touch on, you know, the future audits and reputational risk that might be out there. So what, what should, you know, businesses do? What are, what are the biggest things um, from the biggest piece of advice you provide to them? And we'll just go around the horn. So, so Joe, we'll start with you. Sure, uh, Christine. I'm uh, reflecting back to March. I wrote a, uh, a LinkedIn article uh, 10 C's for surviving COVID-19. Bankers have been trained in the five C's of credit, uh, but it's kind of creativity and crisis. And uh, I've called upon this Einstein quote, uh, for all crises bring progress. Creativity is born from anguish, just like the day is born from the dark night. It's in crisis that inventiveness is born, as well as discoveries made and big strategies born. And I think, you know, that's kind of what I would say is the silver lining in all of this, if, if it can be said at a time when everybody is struggling. Um, 
is to take a step back and, and think about uh, this as an opportunity to, to reposition your business. And four of the C's I want to comment on quickly is in thinking about working with any financial provider, um, I would really stress character and communication. Character meaning um, do what you need to do to address the hard problems in your business head on. They don't get better with time. Uh, and secondly, make sure you're actively communicating with your financial providers all that's going on in your business. And obviously that communication extends with transparency to uh, clients, employees, vendors, et cetera. Uh, but, um, you know, we're finding that businesses and business owners and adversity, we really see who has the stripes uh, kind of anchored in that, um, that character element. And we're really much more able to provide uh, advice on the various loan products that we've described on this panel if we have transparency and communication, uh, you know, from the business owner. On the flip side, as we think about, you know, approaching kind of long term here, as I said, opening the aperture, um, you know, the, the two areas that we've really stressed to, to business owners is creativity. There are changes that are happening to us as we operate our bank. We've been operating remotely since the middle of March. What are the business practices? What are the business models that are going to change? And, you know, while the world will uh, unthaw and people will, you know, return to normal, there will be business practices that change. And how is that going to impact your business and be creative about new revenue models that might emerge or ways in which you can stop spending money in certain areas to make your business more profitable? And secondly, we've in, 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 in advised business owners to think about their capacity, uh, particularly those that are impacted by business volumes. Are there things in your business that have gone unattended to uh, deferred maintenance items that you can use your employees, even if uh, the business is not there to engage them? address those unattended things. You know, in our business, uh, you know, we have a Salesforce CRM. We don't have all the information filled out about every client. Or there are um, maintenance items in our sales offices that we haven't attended to. So every business owner has got some things that uh, are on the list of I'm too busy to get to, uh, but they remain important. And this is an opportunity to enhance capacities so that uh, businesses can uh, survive and thrive in the long run. Those would be my thoughts. Excellent. You, you hit a lot of them. So I'm just going to open it um, to the panel as a whole from the perspective of um, if there's anything else you want to layer on top of what Joe said, and then we're going to ask the, the questions that have come in from the chat because we want to make sure we get those covered. So anything to kind of layer on um, what Joe said, um, and then I'll ask the, the two questions in the chat that we haven't addressed. So Christine, um, I would just add that, you know, um, our small businesses in the U.S. are extremely creative, right? And so they will find a way and they're going to have to find a way to make this work. My only additional piece of advice is this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. So don't think that if the, the economy or we start to open it up, if everything will be solved, right? Um, there's still a long way to, to see through this. So uh, the, some of the help that the government has provided might be able to get you through the last four weeks and the next four to eight weeks, but you have to plan a little bit longer term than that. Um, to give you an example, if we keep social distancing in place and we start bringing people back to our offices and, and when we bring people back to the office, that would actually leave, give life to all the businesses that are near the office. So small restaurants, small shops that people are going to start using again. But you have to keep in mind, if we keep social distancing, you're only going to be able to bring up to 50% of our colleagues back to the office. We cannot bring 100% back. So that will be a new reality for our office colleagues, and that will be a new reality for everybody that depends on those colleagues. Same for a restaurant, same for any type of shop. We are going to have less people available to attend, and not just for the next two or three months, until we develop a vaccine or, or we figure something out with immunity, this is a, a longer term race. Absolutely. 
definitely good good points. Terrific. Anybody? If else? I could also, if okay. I could also add something, um, you know, I've heard Joel Peterson, the chairman um, for JetBlue, he talks about run into the fire. You know, lean into this um, uncertainty because, you know, leaders are real leaders are are forged in fire. You know, basically during these tough times, um, really determine how you're going to, you know, survive and thrive. Um, and I like Joe's comments on, you know, take this time. Um, maybe a little bit more downtime than you normally would have to get that to-do list done and also to plan and revamp your business model going forward. Um, you know, lean on your resources. Um, you know, things are changing all the time. They're fluid. Um, none of us on this call know what the final answer or result is going to be. However, we are all here as a resource for all of, all of the small businesses on this call, as well as in our community. So reach out to us. We are here to help you guys. You are not alone. Excellent. Very good. So um, one question that came in after the approval for um, an SBA EIDL loan, what is the timeline for the funds to be deposited? Any thoughts or insights on that? So Christine, the uh, EIDL loan is an SBA direct uh, program. It's not run through the banks. Um, we are hearing that there are tremendous delays and backlog there. I have had a couple clients that were lucky enough, fortunate enough to get funded already, but I, I honestly can't uh, uh, provide too much insight in terms of the timeline, except just to give you a little bit of a context of what's going on with that program. Furthermore, I think they stopped taking applications for loan sizes over $150,000 and have limited it to agricultural businesses only, effective yesterday. So that program is ever evolving. But back to the original point on funding, um, big backlog. Hopefully you'll get your funding soon. Maybe some of the other panelists have some more insight on, on the timeline for funding. So the loans are supposed to be funded, not, not uh, this one, but PPP in 10 days, right? That's, that's the mandate. Uh, from the time they were, that the banks got the approval from the SBA, they have to be funded within 10 days. Uh, given the, uh, the backlog and the issues, we have been given a bit of an extension on that. Uh, but I think it's no more than 20 days when they have to be funded. Just, just to be clear, that was PPP, not EIDL. PPP, so, yes. Okay. Yeah. PPP. All right. Any insight on the EIDL? If not, I can flip to the next question, which is relative to the sheer volume of applications and nominal dollars of loans um, booked in such a short time, um, can the panelists provide some background and clarity on how to utilize technology partners or federal liquidity loans to support their loan originations and fundings? Good question. A lot of stuff in there. <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. You know, I'll, I'll take a swing at the technology partner side. We, we, we actually, at Freedom Bank, um, as we saw the opportunity emerge, we engaged with a fintech partner who was um, going to provide for us the ability to bundle the loans and effectively batch process them and connect to the uh, SBA through an API. The theory being you could significantly accelerate submission of the loans to the E-Trans system, which is the system that ingests loans on the part of the SBA. Again, that was set up for a level of volume that's far lower than what's been experienced. As we, uh, we, we, we ran parallel paths with that partnership, working on our own internal capabilities, and about five days into this, we realized that coding to, um, you know, on the part of a fintech, for a um, criteria at the SBA that was ever changing was a recipe for disaster. And it was uh, nothing against the SBA, nothing against the FinTech provider, but you know, the coding, there has to be a, a hard wire solution. And so uh, we ended up withdrawing from that and basically processing all of them manually. And I think in the oh, wow. PPP, uh, the first installment of PPP, that was actually kind of a system failure that the the uh, the fintech solution was unable to be successful now uh, we got into 2.0 ppo and there were gating mechanisms put up by the sba and much more clarity on the uh, xml files that could be submitted and uh, the stability of the system improved and so we do understand that the fintech providers were more successful in the second round and i've heard small business owners 
tap some of the traditional fintech partners for those loans. Um, but it's a it's a difficult environment to utilize when it's so rapidly changing. Um, I think in the long run, again, as I said at the outset, um, you know the bigger financial institutions want to move to scale, and the technology path is the way to do that. But oftentimes, what's in the best interest of the small business is to deal with a smaller provider who has a human that can engage with you, understand your business, and deliver the firm when you need them, not when it's convenient for the provider. Absolutely. And, and Christine, to yeah. add to that, um, we did everything manually as well, right? We did 16,000 plus apps manually for PPP, PPP one and two. But on phase two, the first day, uh, some of the largest or the top five banks in the US, they had developed what Joe mentioned, the ability to submit thousands of applications on a batch process in a matter of minutes, and it completely crashed the system. And so that same night, first day uh, of the second phase of PPP, the SBA came out and prohibited all banks from using any batch processing system leveraging technology and that leveled the field plane for all banks across the entire US. And then also what the SBA did is that they cut off access to um, a lot of banks, um, being all banks above $1 billion in assets for certain times of the day so that the smaller banks that Joe is mentioning will have sole access to the funds and the ability to process more loans during those hours. Okay, so the the story continues for sure. Um, I just want to, we're at the top of the hour. Thank you guys. We hit all the questions that were brought in. Um, what a fantastic discussion. And we talked even before this call about a 2.0 to this call. So um, be on the lookout for, um, you know, repeat um, webinars uh, to, to further discuss this because we know this is just the beginning of the discussion and the dialogue. So thank you, you each and every one of the panelists um, for your great insights. Really appreciate your time and your energy in a very, very busy time. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brett for any final comments, um, but thanks again for your time today. Awesome. Just want to echo uh, Christine's comments to the panel. Uh, I know, you know, it, it's a lot to ask for you guys to take time out of your busy day, especially the banking institutions right now that uh, Marcel and I have done a, a couple podcasts on this and we've been chatting for a couple months, you know, unlike 2008 to echo his points, you know, the banks are kind of the good guys this time instead of being uh, perceived as the bad guys like last time. So thank you so much. Um, if you as an audience member, if you had a question and there's something that you want to ask, you know, feel free to shoot. Um, us an email, uh, you know, we can try to get it out to, to the panelists as well. Um, and as Christine mentioned, we do, we, there are some discussions of trying to come back to this, especially towards the end of June, when the PPP loans are going to be done and then say, you know, let's reconvene as a group and then now say, what are the challenges that firms are going to be facing when July 1 turns around and all of a sudden they may not have those funds available to them anymore. Um, so with that, just want to say thank you all to, to a panel once again. Uh, and thank you to the uh, audience members for, for tuning in. Uh, you know, this just continues a series that we've been trying to do at Mason to bring you relevant insights from people who are making key decisions that affect business, at, business and society right now. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and end it and just say thank you all very much.